Amen. All right, we're going to get started tonight. Uh, we're looking at 1 Kings chapter 17 tonight. This is our usual uh, Developing on Wavering Faith night with Reverend Sanford Dickerson, but he's out of town. He's on vacation. So we're going to go ahead and, and, uh, and, and switch uh, topics and uh, preach a sermon that I preached at Zion. Oh, it must have been three years ago or so. I've uh, been there five years, more than five years now, five and a half years I've been at Zion. And uh, I'm going to go back and, 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 and touch on uh, the topic of profile of a 21st century believer uh, and looking at Elijah. First Kings chapter 17, uh, verses 1 to 7. First Kings chapter 17, verses 1 to 7. Amen. All right. If we would all stand for the reading of God's holy word. Amen. The word of the Lord says, and Elijah, the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here, and turn eastward, and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Amen. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to uh, share the good news of Jesus Christ uh, as we look at this uh, profile of Elijah. Uh, speak to our hearts tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. We're living in difficult times to be a believer in, in the God who created the heavens and the earth, the God who loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The society we're living in can be hostile to our faith tradition. It can be insulting and disparaging to people who really believe in the word of the Lord. Uh, I've quoted the study that showed from the Institute of Jewish and Community Research in 2007 that was attempting to discover anti-Semitism on college campuses, but instead was shocked to find that more than half of the professors and American universities and colleges have a strong intolerance toward Christians who really believe. Mischaracterizations of our beliefs and assaults on our intelligence are either cloaked in clever language by politicians and media or just flat out stated. Uh, one Christian sociologist attended a lecture on a college campus about Christian missions in Australia when in the midst of the discussion time, a, a philosophy professor stood up and loudly proclaimed, Christianity is a blankety blank religion. And to make sure everyone heard him correctly, he repeated himself with even greater enunciation. Of course, I don't use those kinds of words, but I think you can kind of get the idea. And, and what amazed the Christian sociologist was that no one challenged that philosopher on this, including the Christian sociologist. If he had said something of that nature about Islam or some other group, other faculty would have surely took him to task over such a hateful statement. More and more, the 21st century is looking like a hostile territory for people who really believe the word of God. Like the giant Goliath of Gath, the world is engaging in intimidation tactics designed to frighten the 21st century believer into silence, into sadness, and into shame. It's hostile territory. Ahab made it hostile territory for the believer Elijah. So if we're really going to believe in Jesus today and going forward, if we're really going to fulfill God's word in our lives, if we're really going to be in a covenant relationship with the Lord, there are some characteristics we're going to have to develop. There are some expectations we're going to have to prepare for. And in the process, we cannot allow those doing the assaulting to become the determiners of our character. In other words, to borrow from the German philosopher of yesteryear, Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, we must not become the monster that we're seeking to destroy. Jesus is our Lord, not society. Jesus tells us what to do, not everybody else. Jesus saved my soul, not the media, not the internet, not some secular philosophy or some popular way of living. Jesus is our savior. So no matter how hateful people speak of us, we are following Jesus, 
not those hateful people. Do not allow them to shape your behavior, your attitude, your disposition, and certainly not your words. Speak Jesus' words the way Jesus wants you to, not the hateful speech that people are saying about us. Now, there are many examples of faith under fire in the Bible, and the vast majority of the Bible was written during one period of political and religious oppression or another. Uh, one that has often fascinated me is the prophet Elijah. I'm fascinated because he appeared with Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration with our Lord. I'm fascinated because he endured so many of the trials you and I endure today. And I'm fascinated because of the similarities of the times and the timing of the cultural shifts then and now, which made it difficult for Elijah and for us to be true believers. For it was only a few generations earlier that the people of God were led by a king named David, who sought the Lord, who aimed to please the Lord, who wrote and sang praises to the Lord, and who trusted in the law of the Lord. A generation later, and Solomon would do what was evil in the sight of the Lord and worship the gods of other lands and took multiple wives like they did in these other lands. And by the time we get to the 17th chapter of 1 Kings, there have been several kings of Israel who had attempted to outdo each other in rebelling against the laws of the Lord. Ahab in the 16th chapter took the practice of selfish rebelliousness to a new level by marrying Jezebel the daughter of the king of the Sidonians, and together they worshiped and served Jezebel's god, Baal. They were the king and queen of the people of God, but they actually worshiped and served her false god, Baal. And maybe I should have called this the profile of a 21st century true believer, because there's a whole lot of folks like Ahab who call themselves believers, but their lives worship and serve some other gods. Ahab was an Israelite in name only, but he worshiped and served Baal. Similar to how folks these days claim they're a Christian, but they worship and serve their political parties instead of the Lord Jesus. I'm talking about being a true believer, a true believer profile, what it looks like to be a true believer in the 21st century, not just in name only, not just a Sunday Christian, not just someone who was raised in the church, but now they don't ever attend, not someone who shows on Sunday and then lives like the devil on Monday. I'm talking about a real believer, a true believer, someone who really believes Jesus lived and died and rose again, someone who really trusts in the Lord in all their ways. And I'm not talking about perfect people neither, uh, but about true believers, people who when we stumble and fall, we get back up and get back in the race. When we miss the mark, we, we reload and take better aim and get it right the next time. Who, When we get tired and weary and think we're about to give up, we look to the hills from whence cometh our help. Uh, we know that God allows U-turns. We know that God gives second chances, and that's why we turn to him. Now, into this setting of a society, that was worshiping and serving the Baals under King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, this king who led the people in worshiping and serving other gods, uh, into this setting, Elijah the Tishbite enters the stage. The name Elijah in the Hebrew means, my God is Yahweh. It signifies that he is singularly focused, unwavering in his commitment to his God, that he is resistant to the worship of outside deities. My God is Yahweh the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one true God, the Lord God mighty in battle, El Shaddai, my God is Yahweh. Anybody know that you're serving the one true God, that there's no doubt in your mind, that you've made up your mind, you've decided to follow Jesus, you realize that the gods of this world just wind up hurting you, they just wind up leaving you empty inside and wind up leaving you addicted to something that ruins your life, and now you're sure that my God is Yahweh, my God is Jesus Christ, my God is the one true God, the one true living and loving God who picked me up and turned me around and placed my feet on solid ground. He gave me a second chance, so my God is Yahweh. I tried everything else and everything else failed, so my God is Yahweh. Now in the 17th chapter, we get introduced to the person of Elijah. So let's examine his life in, the, in, in this, this series, this, this thought tonight, and see what we learn about what it takes or what to expect if we're going to be a true believer in the 21st century. The first thing we see him doing is speaking out against an ungodly king. Ahab was the king of Israel, the king of God's people, but he was worshiping and serving Baal, and that ain't right. And whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, if you're a true believer in Jesus Christ and the king does something ungodly, 
When the king does something wrong, when the king does something unjust, a true believer stands up for what is right, not for whoever's on the throne if they're in their political party. A true believer prioritizes God's justice over man's elected officials. A true believer puts the Lord first, not their political party, not their national allegiance, not anything. And it has somewhat surprised me that so many have tied their belief system in this day to a political party. Uh, when I've yet to see a political party that prioritized God in every aspect of its politics. Some don't treat foreigners the way Jesus said to. Others don't treat babies the way Jesus said to. Others don't treat poor folk right. And others can't seem to figure out what a marriage is. Ain't none of them right. Ain't none of them prioritizing the Lord our God. A true believer has to put his God above his political party, above his king. When the king is messing up, a true believer has to stand up for the Lord. When the king is forgetting the Lord God, a true believer keeps on trusting in the Lord our God. Let's move on. Look at verse 2 in chapter 17. The word of the Lord came to him and said, go from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the Wadi Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. The Lord told Elijah that he had to hide. The second thing about the 21st century believer is that we will not be popular in society. I'll say it again. A 21st century believer will not be popular in society. Elijah had to hide in his own country because the political climate was not conducive to his standing up for God. Sometimes the shifts are so subtle, which take a, a God-fearing nation into the climate that is more and more becoming dangerous to share your faith about that God. But here's the truth of the matter, saints. We are living in hostile territory. We are not on our home field anymore. There is a danger in speaking up for Christ in this world, and I think we all kind of sense it. There's a danger in speaking the truth in this world. And when it gets dangerous to speak truth in a society, not only are we seeing the onset of totalitarianism and governmental dictatorship, but God don't like it. So he says to Elijah, go from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the Wadi Cherith. Third thought. I want to share with you about 21st century believers is that 21st century believers got to know that the Lord has a plan for them in the midst of the hostile territory. Listen, saints, while it's true that this world is increasingly hostile, please keep in mind that the Lord knows exactly what we're going through. The Lord has a plan for our protection and for our provision. His plan might look like we're out there all by ourselves by a little brook, but a true believer is going to trust that God has a plan and that God's plans are going to work. Now, let's take a look at that plan. Verse four, he says, you shall drink from the wadi and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. <laughs> the ravens. I know we sing about it sometimes, but I'm so glad God's got the whole world in his hands. He's even got little bitty babies in his hands fish of the sea, birds of the air. He's got the ravens in his hands. And God said, I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. Now, there's all kinds of stories I could tell about animals helping humans. There was a dog out walking in the snow with his master when the man slipped and fell and hit his head on a rock and broke his neck and lay there in the snow dying, yelling for help. But they were too far from anyone to hear him. And before long, the man's voice grew weak and he eventually passed out. The dog, however, kept on barking until someone in the distance realized that the dog was calling for help. And he came and called an ambulance and saved the man's And God told Elijah, I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. There was a cat who awoke one night and began to scratch at the bedroom door and howl and make all kinds of noise so that the people had to get up and check on what the cat was all upset about. Turns out the cat saved the owners of the house from carbon monoxide poisoning. And he told Elijah, I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. God will take every bit of his creation and use it to help his children. Now, I had a dog once when I was a boy who I was sure was a sinner. And I was proven right. That dog would stay out all night, come home early Sunday morning, never went to church, a sinner for sure. One night we came home from Bible study and thieves had burglarized our home, took all kinds of stuff. When we first got in the house, 
that dog was sitting right in the middle of the living room where the TV used to be and where the eight track player used to be. It looked like that dog had been pointing things out to the burglars. You know, hey, don't forget the eight track. Don't forget the TV over there. The silverware, the china, it's over here. That dog was a sinner to be sure. But the ravens, God commanded the ravens to feed Elijah. Now, here's the thing about God's plan for Elijah then and for the 21st century Christian now. Sometimes it may look like God's plan isn't working. Go with me now to verse 7. But after a while, the wadi dried up because there was no rain in the land. You ever wondered if God's plan was going to fail? You ever noticed that the wadi was drying up? Friends were drying up. Finances were drying up. Blessings were drying up. Church was drying up. But if you look at the story, even when the wadi was drying up, the Lord still had a plan. It was a different plan than the first plan. But over in verse 8, the word of the Lord came to him saying, Go now to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and live there, for I've commanded a widow there to feed you. God's got more than one plan, y'all. Uh, God's got a backup plan. We may only see this far in the plan, but God's got more plans for you and for me. In fact, what did Jeremiah say about it? I know the plans, plural. I know the plans I have for you. God's got more than one plan for you. One more thought before we go. Not only does a 21st century believer have to speak truth regardless of political affiliation, not only do we have to be prepared to be unpopular, and we got to trust God's got plans for us, but a 21st century believer will encounter resistance sometimes from the very people we're fitting to help. Go with me now to verse 12. After Elijah went to Zarephath and met the woman and asked for a meal and some water, look what she said. But she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in the jug. I'm now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. See, sometimes we'll get resistance from the very people we're trying to help. Elijah trying to provide a miracle for the widow and her son, but she doubts it, begs to be left alone to die. And remember in verse 9 that God had said he had commanded a widow there to feed him. So here is a woman who is disobeying what the Lord had commanded her to do. She didn't seem to know that the Lord would fix her life so that the oil wouldn't run out, that the meal wouldn't run out, the water wouldn't run out. But she didn't know that the answers to her problems were standing right there in the message of the prophet Elijah, the true believer. Hear me today. Jesus is the best thing this world could ever hear about. The gospel we preach has the answers to the problems so many in the world have. The danger is that sometimes the people with the answers get framed as being the enemy. You recall the story about David and Goliath, how his brothers didn't realize what David was up to when he showed up at the front lines. They didn't realize he was about to become their best friend. They thought he was all talking, no action. Some young punk talking trash. But in reality, David was the best friend they could have had. He's the one that fought Goliath. He's the one that slew Goliath. And I'm so glad David didn't let the response of his brothers deter him from doing what the Lord called him to do. He was trying to help them, and they were giving him resistance. Here in the 17th chapter of 1 Kings, Elijah was rebuffed by the person who needed his help most, a widow with a son dying from what was going on in the world. No hope, vulnerable, exposed, ready to die. And the prophet came ready to bless her with what the Lord told him, but she resisted. Listen, this world is filled with people who are dying, who are depressed, who are hurting, who are bound by one sin or another. And God has sent the church to preach the good news that Jesus is still there for them, that Jesus will supply all their needs, that Jesus can change them, heal them, help them. But so many of them have been conditioned to resist the very help that they need because they've been told the church is the enemy. LGBTQ community, drug addicted folks, depressed people, mentally health, mental health issues folk, people trying to be happy, young people, all of whom are resisting the gospel that is sent to save them, to heal them, to deliver them. 
They don't know that the 21st century believer, the true believer, is really their best friend. The gospel of Jesus Christ is their best friend. You want a better family? The gospel is your best friend. You want to have better mental health? The gospel is your best friend. But look, after she resisted in verse 13, Elijah, the profile of a 21st century believer, look at what he says. He says, do not be afraid. Uh, he doesn't say, oh, you ungrateful heathen after all I tried to do for you. He said, go and do as you have said. He didn't say, don't you know who I am? Don't you know what school I went to? Uh, don't you know I got more things to do? I, I don't have to waste my time if you ain't into it. No, Jesus didn't, didn't tell us to be like that. Jesus came to seek and to save those who are lost. Elijah remembered his mission. He stayed on point. He stayed on what God told him to say. And, and, and that's what our job is as a 21st century Christian. Stay on point. Remember our mission. We're not to, supposed to impose ourselves on others. We're supposed to seek to save those who are lost. Elijah stayed calm. Elijah stayed loving. Elijah stayed encouraging. Look what he did in verse 14. He says, for thus says the Lord God of Israel. In other words, he gave her God's words, not his. God's words, not his attitude. God's word, not his fears, not his anger, not his frustration. God's words. And God's words were, the jar of meal will not be emptied and the jug of oil will not fail. He gave her the promises of the Lord. Oh, well, sometimes I, I just think folk need to know that Jesus is not pointing fingers at folk. He's not hurling hatred at sinners, but that he is standing there with his arms open wide saying, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The world needs to know that all we like sheep have gone astray, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. They need to know that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. They need to know that Jesus is the best thing that could ever happen to them. Jesus ain't the enemy. The gospel ain't the enemy. The church ain't the enemy. Serving the Lord leads to happiness. Trusting in Jesus delivers you from the bondage of life. Jesus is the best thing that could ever happen to you. One last thought, one more thing before I go. Uh, it says the jar of meal, verse 16, the jar of meal was not emptied, neither did the jar jug of oil fail according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. 21st century believer, you got to know that the word of the Lord is true. You got to know that you know that you know that God keeps his promises. The Bible says God's not a man that he should lie, neither the son of a man that he should repent. If he said it, he'll do it. If he spoke it, he'll bring it to pass. You got to know that heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. You got to know that the grass withers and the flower fades away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. You got to know that Jesus is the alpha and he is the omega. He is the beginning and he is the end. He had the first word and he's going to have the last word. You've got to know that God's word is true. Believe it bank on it, trust in it, and then proclaim it. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, we thank you for this time to share the word. We thank you for the testimony of Elijah and the story that's preserved for us, Lord. We pray that every one of us on this line tonight and those who will hear the recording later, Lord, that they will be blessed and challenged to be a true 21st century believer, a true believer, Lord, folk who are not ashamed of the gospel, Folk who know that you've got our backs, folks who know you're going to make a way. Bless us, Lord, so that we may share the faith, share Jesus Christ with everyone. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Right. God bless everybody. Have a great night. We'll see you in the morning at 8 a.m. Amen, Pastor. Can I say something? Amen. Yeah.